I started talking this week about taking the limits off of God. If you missed my service last night, I gave a little bit of history. This is not something that I got just to teach other people. This is something that God has spoken to me. He spoke this to me emphatically January the 31st, 2002. In my estimation, the second most encounter, important encounter I've ever had with the Lord. And since that time, everything in our ministry has increased at least five-fold, maybe six, nine-fold some things. Awesome things are happening. And so I'm, uh, the Lord has been speaking to me that it's time for me to go again and begin to start believing bigger. And last night I taught from Psalm 78, 41, that we can limit God. It says in their heart they turned back and limited the Holy One of Israel. God doesn't sovereignly control what happens in your life. God has a plan for your life, but you have the control over whether what God wants to do in your life is going to happen. You have to cooperate with God. I also used Ephesians 3.20. It says, Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. And that little phrase, according to the power that works in us, links God movement through you or in you to whether or not you have this power of faith working on the inside of you. So last night I was establishing that we can limit God by not believing big enough. We've got a supernatural God who wants to do supernatural things. And most of us are not believing supernaturally. We are thinking small. We need to think big. This morning I began to talk about how that if you don't know God's will, then that is going to limit what God can do. And I took the example of Moses and David and Isaiah, or I don't think I used David this morning, but uh, the same thing is true of David based on 1 Samuel 13, 14. But, but Moses and Isaiah and Paul and Jeremiah and showed how that even before they were formed in their mother's womb, God called them and sanctified them and ordained them to be prophets. God is no respecter of persons. He has a plan for every person's life. And it's not up to you to pick and choose what you want to do and then ask God to bless it. Rather, we need to come and just throw ourselves completely before the Lord and say, God, here am I. What was your purpose? Why did you create me? What is all of the abilities and talents and the time that I'm alive and whether you're male or female and all these things, what is your purpose for me? And you find out what God has called you to do and start doing it. And man, that is one of the keys to taking the limits off of God. You cannot reach your full potential. You can never see everything happen in your life that you would desire to see happen unless you find out what God's purpose for your life is and then conform to it. And it's a process. It's not a one-time thing. It's a process. God won't show you the whole thing all at one time. So that's what we've already covered. What I want to talk about tonight is another thing that hinders people from receiving and, and doing what God called them to do. And that's, this is going to be an oversimplification. Some of you are going to think, well, it's got to be more complicated than that. But it's just fear. There is a fear... There's a natural resistance towards the unknown, a natural resistance towards change. You know, we say this a lot when it comes to our Bible school. We say, how many of you know that there's something more than what you're experiencing, that you aren't walking in everything that God has? And nearly every hand will go up. And then we'll say, now, how many of you are willing to do something and to change? And not near as many hands go up. Most people know that there's more than what they're experiencing. They are praying for change, but they don't want to do anything differently. They're afraid to do something different. That's a definition of insanity to look for change and yet try and do the same thing over and over and yet get different results. If you know that there's something more, if you know that you aren't living the abundant life that God called you to, then you're going to have to do something different. That is so obvious that it seems like everybody ought to know it, and yet there's a fear about, well, I'm comfortable where I am. Where you are may not be good. You know, I've talked to a lot of people this week who are under medical treatment. they got problems, and yet the medicine is making them sick. I talked to one woman who's taking these injections, 
And she told me all of the effects that these ejections are having on her. And I said, man, I'd rather go back to the original problem that you had than to have these multiple things wrong. She's not content. She doesn't like where she is, but she's afraid to change. She's afraid to do something. She might have a pain. She might have something happen. People are so resistant and so afraid to change. But I'm telling you that if you want to take the limits off of God, you're going to have to deal with fear because it's risky serving God. It's risky. People are just afraid to do something and yet they aren't enjoying where they are. This reminds me of when the disciples were in the boat and it says that the boat was now full and Jesus came walking unto them on the water and when they saw him they cried out for fear and he said, fear not, it's I, be not afraid. And Peter said, Lord, if it's really you, bid me come unto you on the water. And all of the people in the boat told him, you're crazy, don't do it. And you know, it's, this, is, this is really a word picture of society. God is supernatural. He's walking on top of the very things that are bothering other people. During this quote-unquote economic crisis, Jesus isn't in heaven wringing his hands and saying, Oh man, it's ruining my plans. How am I going to pull this off? How will we ever make it? How will the kingdom get done? You know, David Hardesty is on the board of some big organizations and they had people come into a meeting and most of the people on the board are part of these nonprofit organizations in Colorado Springs. And they went around, how's everybody doing? And he said, every one of them said, Oh, we're cutting 20%. We're laying off people. We've canceled our plans for expansion. We were going to do this and we aren't going to do it. And they went around the room and asked every person, what's happening? They came to David and David says, we're setting records in every area. We're expanding. We're doing all of these things. And uh, there are some Christians that really think, oh man, we're in an economic situation Let's tighten the belt. Let's retreat. Let's draw back. And yet there's just as many people going to hell and suffering and needing the gospel as any other time. We ought to be expanding. We ought to be doing things. But there's some people that limit God because they think that God is limited to this world system. It's fear that causes people to withdraw and to do this. Jesus isn't wringing his hands. Jesus isn't bothered by all of these kind of things. We shouldn't be bothered by it. Thank you for that thunderous silence. You know, in a way, I feel like a lone voice. I've not heard anybody else saying this. I'm sure somebody else is saying it, but, well, I take that back. I heard Kenneth Copeland do a television program on this. I know that there's other people saying this. But you know what? We ought to be out here. We ought to be going for it. And yet Christians are limiting God because you hear all the chicken littles screaming that the sky is falling. And we're plugged into that and we're letting this fear dominate us. And there, this is a great time. Other people are selling things for pennies on the dollar. You, this is a great time to be buying and investing. In the early 80s when the economy was so bad and I told you the unemployment was 10.6 or whatever it was, did you know that the rest of the 80s was the largest sustained economic growth in the history of the United States? We are setting ourselves up for that. We are in a place... That man, this isn't the time to be operating in fear. You need to be using some faith. Fear paralyzes you. Fear will limit what God can do. And people are just living in fear. They're sick. They don't enjoy where they are, but they're afraid of doing anything different. You know, look at this passage over in 2 Kings chapter... Seven. This is a passage of Scripture that has always inspired me. But this is when the nation of Israel, the northern ten kingdoms, was surrounded by the Assyrians. And they tried to starve them out. They blockaded the city and there was starvation. People were actually eating their own children. They were selling animal dung for large amounts of money. People were eating dung. And paying big bucks to do it. They were starving. It was a terrible situation. And in the midst of this, there were two lepers that sat outside of the... Or was it two or four lepers? Four lepers. 
And uh, let me just pick this up. The, the city was starving. People were eating their own children, eating animals, dung. And it says in verse 3 that there were four lepers, leprous men at the entering end of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Man, I like that. Why, what are we going to do? Just sit here until we die? We got to do something. If we don't do anything, we're going to die. There are some of you that know that if something doesn't change, you aren't going to make it. There's, no, there's not a hope of you living a victorious, joyful, fulfilled, complete life. You know that your life right now is not the way that it's supposed to be, and yet you're afraid to try anything different. That's what these lepers said. They said, why are we sitting here until we die? How long are we going to do this until we die? He says, if we say we enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. If we sit here, we shall die also. Now therefore come and let us uh, fall under the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. (laughs) I love that reasoning. I love it. Again, I go back to the guys in the boat and Jesus comes walking on top of the very thing that had everybody else. It was killing them. They were drowning and yet the people were saying, Peter, don't get out of the boat. What's the deal? <laughs> there was as much water in the boat as there you know, was outside. They were going down. They were going to drown if they stayed where they were. And yet I can guarantee you all those guys in the boat were criticizing him. You're foolish to get out of the boat. But he was going to drown if he stayed in it. There was very little difference between being in the boat and out of the boat. They were both full of water. The boat was going down. It was the smartest thing he ever did to get out of the boat. You know what? You can't walk on the water if you don't get out of the boat. There are some of you that want to see miraculous things in your life, and yet you are so afraid to do anything that would put you in a position where you need a miracle. You're playing it too safe. You don't ever want there to be a bump in the road, and yet you're wanting a great testimony. That's not how, you have to have a test before you get the money. Amen. If you want a testimony, you're going to have to go through some things. You're going to have to get out of what's easy. These four lepers says, how long are we going to sit here? If we stay here, we die. If we go into the city, we die. Let's go out to the Syrians. The worst they can do is kill us. Some people would just be paralyzed by fear. We could die. They were dying already. It was just a matter of days until they were dead. There are some of you that are dying and don't know it. You're like the frog in the pan that the heat is just being turned up slowly and your whole life is wasting away. Some of you are 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years old and your life still isn't fulfilled. You can't look back and say, I have run the race. I have finished my course. You don't have a confidence that you've done what God wants you to do. And yet you're afraid to change. What are you afraid of losing? Well, I've got a house that's nearly paid for. That's not going to satisfy you. That's not changing anybody's life. Well, i got retirement benefits. Some of you aren't going to live long enough to retire. The stress you're under. And the grief and the sorrow is killing you. And you're planning for something that's never going to happen. Man, you need to make your life count. You need to realize, what am I going to do? Just sit here until I die? You know, if you wouldn't recommend your life, if you aren't proud of what God... And I'm not saying proud in an arrogant sense, but thankful and appreciative and proud of what God has done in your life and the things that have happened. If you can't look and be pleased with your life and say, thank you, Father, for a great life. Thank you for the way that things are going. If you can't do that with your life, then I'm telling you, you're dying. And how long are you going to stay there and be afraid to do something? You're dying. The worst that could happen is you die. We've had people before that wanted to come to Bible college and they say, but... I'm just not making it. I'm barely able to live. I'm just one step from being away, uh, living on the streets and being out on the streets, living under a bridge. What would happen if I come to Colorado Springs? Well, you know what? They aren't living. 
They aren't doing very good there as far as I know. We have streets in Colorado Springs and bridges that they can sleep under there. What's the difference in being there out of the will of God and doing what God told you to do and come to Colorado Springs? You know, one of the greatest lessons that God ever taught me is in 1 Kings chapter 17 where it talks about Elijah. And Elijah delivered the word and told Ahab, there's not going to be rain or dew for years until I say so. That could have got him killed. They had killed all of the prophets of the Lord. And yet here he is going and speaking. He was bold. He delivered that word. And he didn't know what the results was going to be. After he delivered the word, not before it. God didn't tell him, all right, if you'll do this, then I'll protect you and things will work out. He just gave him a word and Elijah was bold enough to act on it. After he gave the word, then the word of the Lord came unto him and said, go to the brook Cherith, and because I have, past tense, commanded the ravens to feed thee there. And so he went. And you know how he knew the brook Cherith was miles long. How did he know exactly where to go? because God had already commanded the ravens. Ravens can fly faster than he could walk. And so one of the ways he even do it, he was in the right place, because God had already commanded the ravens. The supply was already there at the book, Brook Cherith. But see, God sends your supply to where he told you to go, not to where you are. He said, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. If for some reason... Elijah would have said, God, I can't go. It's too far. There's a drought on. I don't have enough provision. I'll die along the way or whatever his reason was. If he would have stayed there, he could have prayed. He could have fasted. He could have begged God. He could have interceded. He could have bound, loosed. He could have done all of this. And you know what? God was faithful. God was sending his supply, but it was there at the brook tree earth. It wasn't where he was. It's like a quarterback when he throws the ball. He doesn't throw it to where the receiver is. He throws it to where the receiver is going. And you've got to be going to be able to receive and catch the ball. And if God has told you to do something else, there's people that are saying, well, God, you give me the provision and then I'll go. No, the provision is there. I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. The reason some of you aren't seeing the provision of God in your life is because you aren't all there. You're here. You need to go there. You need to do what God told you to do. And people are always saying, well, I just don't know how I'd make it if I came to Colorado Springs. They aren't making it where they are. But they're afraid to try something different. We had one woman that said, I can't come. I got two dogs. And our Bible college director was very polite and said, as far as I know, they allowed dogs in Colorado. I just told her, I said, kill them. I love animals. I've had dogs all my life. I'm not a mean person, but I tell you what, if a dog got between me and the ministry, I'd let the dog go. I don't care. It's amazing the things. People are so resistant to change. Well, I don't know anybody there. Well, go meet somebody. Well, what would I do for a job? We got thousands of jobs in Colorado. And I'm just using that as an example. It could be, you know, you staying where you are, but whatever your reasoning is, you got to get rid of the fear of change. If you do the same thing, you're going to get the same results. Do something different. It would be better to do something wrong than it is to do nothing. If you're motivated by faith, God can bless a mistake made in faith more than He can bless a mistake that is made out of fear. And you're, it is a mistake for you to just be safe and play it safe. And I don't want to take any chances. I don't want to run any risk. It's taken me 20, 30 years to accumulate this little bit of nothing that I got and I don't want to lose it. <laughs> How long are you going to sit there till you die? Get up and go do something. So these, these guys went out and they said the worst they can do is kill us. 
Brothers and sisters, we hold our life too dear to ourselves. The Apostle Paul says, I'm dead. I'm crucified with Christ. He says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. You know what? You can't stop a guy like that. He goes out and preaches and they say, we're going to kill you if you don't quit preaching. And he just reaches up and kisses them. Wonderful. Amen. I'll go be with Jesus. Well, then we'll stick you in jail. So he goes to praising God and gets all the prisoners and the jailers saved. And so they say, well, we're going to release you. And he says, wonderful. And he goes out and (laughs) preaches the gospel. How do you stop somebody who just really doesn't care whether they live or die? For them to live is Christ and to die is gain. Fear of death is bondage. Some of you are so afraid, well, I might make a mistake. You will. (laughs) You'll make a mistake. If mistakes would kill you, I'd be dead. So they went out and they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. But when they came to the utmost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come against us. And so anyway, these Syrians fled and they left their food still there. The food was still cooking. They left all their gold. They left their raiments. They left their tents. They left everything. And all of a sudden, these guys who were outcast, lepers, had nothing, were starving to death, had no future, went out and became immensely rich. All of the spoils of the enemies were there. And they started eating and they started gathering up gold and garments. And then they said, you know what, we're doing the wrong thing. we got good tidings to tell. And they went back and told the city of Samaria what had happened. And they became the heroes. Outcast came, became heroes because they were willing to take a chance. Because they were willing to change. Because they were willing to say, what's the worst that could happen? They'd kill us. They did something. If they would have stayed there at the gate of the Samaria, that in, they would have died. The people in the city would have died. Everything would have happened. They would have died. How long are you going to sit there and do nothing until you die? I can guarantee you when people come to the end of their life, I've never heard of anybody who says, I wished I'd have played it safer. I wished I hadn't have taken as many risks. I wished I hadn't have believed God. I wished I hadn't have trusted Him. I wished I'd have operated in more fear. I don't, I don't think anybody ever says that. When people come to the end of their life, they have regrets and saying, you know what? I wished I'd have gone for it. I wished I'd have believed God. I wished I'd have done something more with my life. That's the regrets that people have. Brothers and sisters, we don't need to wait until you're old and facing death and come to grips with the fact that, you know what, I haven't made my life count. If you want to take the limits off of God, you've got to get rid of fear. Fear of change. Fear of doing the unknown. People are sick and they don't like where they are, but they're afraid to step out and believe God. It's just the opposite with me. Man, I'd rather be out there on a limb trusting God than playing it safe. Amen? Amen. I had. It's an adrenaline rush. It'll get you excited. (laughs) I remember when we moved from our little 14,600 square foot building into a 110,000 square foot building that the whole payments on our first building were $2,900 a month. The utilities on our second building have turned out to be about eight or $9,000 a month. I was told they were going to be $16,000 a month. The utilities were going to be infinitely more than our old payment on the old building. Our new payment was going to be, I forgot what what that is, $22,000, $23,000 a month, and then the utilities. Thirty-something thousand dollars a month when I was, and we had paid off the other building, so I wasn't even making any of that. You know what? That was a little bit scary, but I loved it. I thought this is awesome. I just like that kind of stuff. It's like God. This is wonderful. You know what? I can stand 
being terrified. It kind of energizes me, but I just, I get bored when everything's normal. I like excitement. I like to be doing something. I like to see something that's taking your faith. and You can get addicted to it. You can get addicted to seeing the miraculous. You know what? It's risky to tell somebody, get out of a wheelchair and grab them and lift them up. But it's exciting too. There are some of you that would love to see the blind eyes open, but you're so afraid to pray for anybody that's blind because it might not work. That's a really negative attitude. It might work. That's the way you have to look at things. Not every person is going to receive, but man, how many will receive? You got to look at the ones that will receive. You need to get the attitude that if you pray for somebody and if they fall over dead, just step over them and say, next. (laughs) Amen. If you're afraid, if you're afraid, you're going to limit God. Fear limits God. Fear releases the power of the devil the same way that faith releases the power of God. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, people are just afraid. They're afraid of change. They're afraid of doing something. I'm afraid of being normal. You can change things to where I'm afraid that I'm not going to be believing God. I'm afraid that I'm not going to do something. Amen? So there's a, there's a fear of change. People are just afraid. They don't want to change. If you don't change, you aren't going to get any different results. And there's also a fear of persecution. And there's some of you, I can guarantee you that if you were to have all of the restrictions removed, you know, you have, you may not understand the end results, but you know some steps, some directions that God wants you to start moving. There's something that He wants you to do. There's something in your heart that you would like to do, but you're afraid of what somebody's going to say. And you know, this, this sounds strange, but we held marriage seminars and we had people fill out questionnaires and I've dealt with a lot of people and I've found this to be true. This is not just an opinion. I've proven it to be true. That there are some of you that are 30 and 40 and 50 years old that you're afraid of what the in-laws are going to say. What your parents are going to say if you were to pick up and move and take the grandkids away and what kind of criticism are you going to get and what's your family members going to say and everybody has lived right there their whole life and you would be breaking up the family and just criticism like that. There's people that let the fear of what other people have to say limit what God can speak to you. It says in uh, Proverbs chapter 29 in verse 25, it says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whosoever puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. If you are afraid of men, you're going to limit God. You will never see God's will come to pass in your life. You know, in ministry... There's things that God places on my heart to say. And sometimes people misunderstand my bluntness and the way that I talk and they think that I'm mean or something. And people criticize me over that. But you know what it is? I've just reached a place. The Lord spoke to me one time and He says, if I inspire you to say something and if you're afraid that the people may not like it, that it might offend them, the Lord spoke to me, then what you're doing is you're rejecting that truth for them. You aren't even giving that person the opportunity to reject the truth on their own. You have judged them unworthy that they aren't going to accept it. So you rejected it and held it back and didn't tell them the truth that's going to set them free. And I tell you, when the Lord showed me that, I've just decided that I'm going to tell the truth. And I'm going to tell you the truth. And if you reject it, it's your choice, but I'm not going to reject it for you. Ministers are often afraid to say what's really in their heart. They know that this person isn't going to get healed. They know that their heart's not right. They know that there's unbelief. They know that there's things going on, and yet they'll just go ahead and play the game and put a prayer out there that they know is not going to happen because the person's not receiving. And rather than tell the person the truth and love, they'll sit there and just go through the motions 
And then the person has a negative experience, nothing happens, and they come back and it just builds and solidifies and confirms their doubts and their unbelief and makes them worse off. You need to get to the point where you tell people the truth. If you come to me and say, does this dress make me look fat? I'll tell you, amen. I'll try and be uh, polite about it and say, well, it's uh, really a nice looking dress, but yeah, you know, it does. You look fat. I'll tell you the truth. (laughs) You know, that's kind of funny, but the truth is that many of you, I guarantee you, you just are so afraid. You're codependent upon people's approval. You always have to have people reaffirming you and you it would just devastate you if somebody was to reject you. You're going to limit God because I can guarantee you God will lead you to do things that are unpopular. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 Paul spoke and he said, "Yea, all of those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution." If you are living godly, you will be persecuted. The only persons who are not persecuted are ungodly people, not like God people. If you're going to be like God, God is going to lead you contrary. While everybody else is wailing and talking about, oh, we're in a recession and it's worse since the Great Depression and they're just saying things that aren't true and and repeating the mantra that is being spoken and overstating and amplifying, exaggerating, lying about things. And if you stand up and tell them the truth, I guarantee you, you're going to be unpopular. Somebody's going to criticize you. Somebody's going to call you, you're like an ostrich. you got your head in the sand. You aren't facing reality. While everybody else is griping about, man, the wars and the rumors of the wars, and you're over here rejoicing because our redemption draws nigh. I'm re- Lift up your head and rejoice is what Jesus said to do. People are going to think, what's wrong with you? While everybody else is talking about all of the sickness and the disease... You know, we just went over to um, Kasese, Uganda, and I've been there twice now. That's where the Ebola virus started. That's where there's been thousands and thousands of people. You get this virus and you're dead within hours, and we go there and minister to those people and lay hands on them. And other people, you can't do that. And I'm just fine. Amen? Amen. There's going to be people that speak their unbelief and their fear. And if you are a man pleaser, the fear of man will bring a snare and keep you from doing what God called you to do. If you're afraid of men, if you are dependent upon their approval, you'll never fulfill God's will. If you have to be reinforced constantly and have people stroke you and say, it's okay, you're all right. You'll never make it. And I'm saying this in love, brothers and sisters, but we got a lot of weak Christians that don't depend on the Lord, that God's opinion about you is not all you need. We sang that song tonight. Doug and Cammie led us in this song about you're all I need. But there's lots of people sitting right in this room that Jesus isn't all you need. If your husband or your wife or your kids or your parents or your people that you work with were to go to criticizing you, you would stay home and suck your thumb and moan over this for days because somebody rejected me. I'm saying that in love. I'm telling you that that's childish. The only people that will ever let you down are the ones that you lean on. You need to get to a place where you love people and you're nice to people and you minister to people because of how it will benefit them. But all you need is Jesus. And if everybody forsakes you but Jesus, you're still happy. You're still content. You can reach a place where you don't have to have everybody else's approval. Just knowing that God loves you is more than enough. Nobody likes rejection. God didn't make man for rejection. He created us for His pleasure. So there's a natural dislike for rejection. Nobody likes it. I don't like it. If you come up tonight and tell me that you hate everything I've said and that you think I'm terrible, it's not going to bless me. I'm not going to get happy over it. But it won't keep me up tonight. 
You know why? Because I know that God loves me. And compared to God, you're nobody. Amen? I don't mean that bad, but I'm just saying that compared to God, you just aren't anybody. I had a man come up one time and just go to railing on Jamie for the way that she dressed. And there, Jamie never dresses bad. She's always looks very nice and stuff. He was talk, She was Pentecostal and she had her hair fixed and was wearing makeup and, and gold and rings and stuff. And so he thought that that was ungodly. And he started dressing me down and saying, you need to get control of your wife and do all this. And, you know, I just stopped this guy and I said, hey, who died and made you God? And he just stopped and looked at me and he says, what, what are you saying? I said, why should I care what you think about my wife? You're nobody. I don't care about you. I don't care about your opinion. And he got so offended. Like, well, I can't believe that. And I said, fella, you are nobody to me. I just don't give a rip what you think. <laughs> and this guy just couldn't believe it. But nobody's going to rent space in my mind. Your opinion just doesn't really matter. I know some of you think I'm weird. I think you're weird. I tell you what, Jesus loves me. Jesus has spoken to me, and I am so confident that Jesus loves me. It's not going to bless me if people hate me, but you know what? It's not going to keep me up. As long as I know that I'm doing what the Lord's told me to do, I'll say it. And if you don't like it, there's the door. I love you. But don't let it hit you on the way out, praise God. I know that what I'm saying is very politically incorrect. And most of you just can't handle this because in our society, well, you can't offend anybody. Jesus, his disciples came to him, Master, don't you know that the Pharisees were offended? And he says, let them be offended. Man, they're the blind leading the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they're both going to fall into the ditch. He he told a group of people one time, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And they thought, he's speaking of cannibalism. (laughs) And they said, how can we eat your flesh and drink your blood? And he says, he didn't say, oh, you misunderstood. Let me explain. Let me make sure that nobody takes offense. He didn't care. He says, again, I say unto you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. He didn't explain himself. He made it worse. And his disciples says, man, they thought you were talking of cannibalism. And he says, if they weren't planted by my father, they'd have been plucked up anyway. He says, let them, leave them alone. They came and said, nothing, no prophet arises out of Nazareth. The Bible prophesied that Jesus would come out of Bethlehem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He could have explained that. He could have told them, now look, my parents were in that taxing and we were there. And you remember when Herod went to kill all of the infants? We fled into Egypt and then we moved to Nazareth. But I was born. He could have explained that. He could have answered their questions. He could have come down. Jesus never offered any explanation of anything. We are so fearful of people. We are so fearful of what people have to say. We have to have everybody's approval. I'm not saying that you don't love people. I love people. I love people enough that I'm going to tell them the truth. If you are not telling your neighbor the truth because you're afraid that they're going to criticize you, somebody's going to say something about you, the truth is you love yourself more than you love them. You should love other people enough to tell them the truth. Do it in love. Be tactful. You can be more tactful than I am. You can be nicer than I am. But you need to tell people the truth. You need to speak the truth. And you need to get to a place where you aren't afraid to tell people what the truth is. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, there's some of you that know the truth. There's some of you that work in a situation that your opinion is better than other people's opinion. You're born again. You're going to heaven. They're going to hell. They're blind. They're operating under demonic deception. You have a better understanding, a better grip on things than they do, and yet you're afraid to tell people the truth because somebody might criticize you. And so you would rather let people die and go to hell than to tell a person the truth because somebody might say something about you. You're going to limit God. You'll never fulfill God's will on your life if you're afraid of men. 
The fear of man brings a snare. And you know, the only way to get over this, again, there is a natural desire for acceptance. God created us for acceptance. It's abnormal to be to a place to where you don't let what people say about you bother you. The only way you can reach that place, it says over in 1 John chapter 4, let me read this verse to you. And in verse 18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear, because fear hath torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. The antidote to this, it's not like you can just sit there and become so hardened that you don't care what anybody else thinks. There, there would be something wrong with you if a person can insult you and it doesn't uh, affect you in some way. You weren't made for rejection. You shouldn't get so hardened that people that you enjoy people rejecting you. Something's wrong with you if you do that. But you can get to a place to where God's perfect love is so real to you that it cast out your fear. If you're afraid to tell a person the truth because of what they might say the truth is, you don't understand how much God loves you and you have to have the acceptance of people because you're at a deficit in God's acceptance. When God Almighty has accepted you, you just reach a place to where nobody else in comparison. I mean, nobody else compares. It doesn't mean anything. You know, if the President of the United States was to call me up and ask me to go out to eat with him, and then you came up and said, you know what, let's cancel our dinner engagement. I don't think I want you to go out with me. And if the President had just asked me to go out with him, I had to be easy to say, well, you know what, the President invited me. (laughs) No big deal that I missed out on your dinner engagement. And that's the way it is. God has accepted me, and so I don't like people rejecting me. I don't like criticism. We get a lot of hate mail. We get a lot of people saying things about me. There are people that hate me with a passion. I have made some of the leading programs in the nation exposing me as a cult and saying things. That doesn't bless me, but you know what? It's not going to stop me from doing what I'm doing. It's not going to keep me up at night. I don't like it, but it's not going to stop me from doing what God's told me to do. you got to reach a place to where you don't have fear of man. If, you have, if the Lord was to speak to you and tell you to go over to Uganda and become part of our team and see lives change, we are changing an entire nation. There's over 250,000 people per week that are going through our discipleship evangelism course and people's lives being changed in Uganda alone. The first lady's doing it. Things are happening. It's awesome stuff. And if God was to speak to you and tell you to be a part of that, and if your first thought is, what are the in-laws going to say? <laughs> well, oh, what are they? what's my family going to say if I was to pick up and go over to the other side of the world? If somebody else's opinion affects your decision, then you're in bondage. Now, if you, out of love, say, well, I need to make sure this is God because I don't want to offend people, well, that's a different thing. But I'm saying if you're fearful because of what somebody else says and you know what God has told you but you're afraid, it's hard and you're struggling to get it out because you're afraid of what somebody else might say, you got a fear of men. That's wrong. Brothers and sisters, that'll limit what God can do in your life. The fear of man brings a snare. You aren't going to see God's power manifest in your life if you are codependent on people and have to have their approval and their acceptance. Moses was a mighty leader, and yet they wanted to string him up many a time. Amen. Any great man or woman of God is going to have opposition. If you live godly in Christ Jesus, you shall suffer persecution. The only people that aren't persecuted are ungodly people. If you live godly, somebody's going to dislike you. That's true. If everybody loves you, if you never have anybody upset with you, everybody just thinks you're awesome, you aren't a godly example. Jesus is the greatest example of love the world ever saw and people hated him because light exposes darkness and the darkness can't abide the light. They will come out and try and condemn you every single time. If you're just looking for the least path of resistance, you're going to limit God. 
It's going to cost you uh, some people's opinions. There's going to be criticism. But you know the good thing is if you keep serving the Lord, God works things out. My family rejected me big time, thought I'd lost my mind. And you know what? Now they're all in my corner. They all love me. They all see what God is doing and God has blessed us. Jamie's brother and, I mean, sister and brother-in-law, Baptist, thought we were crazy. We've had quite a few conversations. They just came to my meetings in Dallas, Fort Worth, got baptized in the Holy Spirit, have gone back to their Baptist church, are teaching the materials and looking for another church because uh, (laughs) they no longer are accepted in the Baptist realm. And we're, you know, it's only taken 40 years, but it's working, praise God. God will pull you through if you can stand the pull. (laughs) Amen. It may take a while, but things will work. I'm telling you, you, you're just going to have to get to a place where you exalt God to such a place that compared to God, nobody else compares. It's like looking at the sun. You know these bright lights right here? If I was to stare at those lights, I could look at you and not even really be able to see you because I'd I'd still be seeing spots in front of my eyes. You can get into the presence of God so much that the things of this earth grow dim and they just don't dominate you. And what people have to say doesn't control you. I'm not saying you get to where you don't care, but you get to where it doesn't control you. You can cast your care about it over on the Lord and go on. If you are going to be a man pleaser, you'll not be a God pleaser. Amen or oh me. Man, I could stay on this all night long. I need to move on. But this is, this is really important. I had a woman in um, Esteline, Texas, who had cancers on her body. Three big old growths. She had one on the back of her shoulder, one here under her side, and one on the inside of her leg. And they were, I don't know, six inches or more across they, her blood vessels were exposed. She was squirting blood. They gave her up to die. They sent her home and said, there's nothing you can do, and gave her a week to live. And anyway, her family came and got me. I went over to her house. I talked to her for an hour or two, and I didn't pray with her. I said, you know what? You need to do something. You need to come to our Bible study. And she says, I'm dying. I can't even get out of bed. They had a catheter in her and all of this stuff. She couldn't move. She couldn't get up to relieve herself. She couldn't do anything. And I said, you know what? If somebody told you that if you'd get to the hospital, you'd be healed, you'd make it. I said, rent an ambulance if you have to. So she did. She rented an ambulance. And she came to the Bible study that night. Drove 14 miles. Came to the Bible study. And you know what? I prayed for her and that woman was instantly healed. (laughs) Within a day or two... Those tumors had shrunk to the size of a quarter. All of her bleeding had stopped. And she had an appointment scheduled in Houston with a specialist, but there was no point in going because the doctor said there was no treatment that they could give her, so she hadn't planned on going. But now she was feeling so good, she went down to this specialist, and he looked at it and looked at her charts, and he says, I don't know who told you all these other things, but this is, and it's just a skin cancer. He cut it off in the office with a local anesthetic and said, there's nothing wrong with you. You're totally well. But because of these charts, let's give you radiation just in case. So he put her through radiation. She nearly died. She was in intensive care for two weeks. And when she got out of intensive care and came home, I went over and saw her. And I said, you know God healed you. And she says, I know it was God. It wasn't any radiation. It wasn't them cutting this off. It wasn't a misdiagnosis. She said, God healed me. And I said, well, then why would you take these treatments? That'll kill a well person. And she says, I know it, but my family, they don't understand healing and they just feel like I would be foolish. And people at my church think I ought to do everything the doctors say. And, and, I, and I said, but you've got an allergic reaction to this. It nearly killed you. You were in intensive care for two weeks. And she says, but I just don't want to disappoint people. And anyway, that woman went back for the second round of her treatments and she died from it. And her family thought, well, God didn't heal. That woman was healed. It was that chemotherapy that killed her. And you know how that happened? Because she was afraid of what people had to say. So she wouldn't stand because she didn't want to disappoint people. Brothers and sisters, you aren't going to fulfill God's will unless you are so secure 
in the Lord that you don't have to have somebody else validate you and approve of what you think God has told you to do. And if you are living that kind of a life, you're going to limit what God can do in your life. You just can't live that way. That's fear. The fear of man brings a snare. People are afraid of failure. I think the biggest failure of all is to do nothing. That's failure. And here's something that will surprise some of you, but you know what the biggest fear that I had back in 2002 when the Lord spoke to me that I was limiting God? you know what my biggest fear was? Success. I was afraid of success. Because more people are destroyed by success than they ever are by hardship. Some of you may not understand that, but that's absolutely true. I could give you hundreds of people that I've personally known who started out fine. Like, for instance, over in 1 Samuel, it talks about, uh, I think it's 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 13. I won't take time to look it up, but it's somewhere around there. And Samuel was talking to Saul, and he said, When you were little in your own sight, then God promoted you and made you king over his people. But now you become arrogant. Success corrupted him. He was dependent upon God when it was beyond his ability, but after a while he got to reading his own press releases. He got to thinking, I can do all of this. And instead of obeying the man of God, he got in and offered a sacrifice which kings weren't supposed to do. He overstepped his bounds, went into the realm of the priest. He quit being God-dependent. And success has ruined more people than hardship and failure ever has. And I've seen that. And because of it, I'm aware that once you begin to start seeing God, things happen. There's a temptation for arrogance in things like this. And you know what? I, I didn't want to go there. I was in a position where I was being used and touching people's lives, but it wasn't to the point that it was really a temptation for me to get arrogant about it, and it was safe. And I could just stay there. And you know what? Finally, it's the same antidote for all of these types of fears. The Lord spoke to me, 1 John 4, 18. Perfect love cast out fear, because fear has torment. He that fears has not been made perfect in love. He said, Andrew, I've worked on you for 34 years. And you're going to have to just trust me that I'm, I can keep you and that I can keep your heart right and that I can keep you focused on me and that you aren't going to change and that you aren't going to be something different. It went back to my trust, my relationship with God. Perfect love is the way that I dealt with that. There are some people that honestly, they're, they're afraid of success. It's easier to work for somebody. Let them bear all of the problems than you to go out and start your own business and run the risk of failure. And take that responsibility. It's easier to sit there and just punch a card at a job that you hate. But yet you're guaranteed to get your paycheck. And you're guaranteed as long as you don't do something major wrong that they'll keep you on and that you'll get your benefits and that you can just live a mediocre life and die and leave. And you've played it too safe. There are some people that are afraid of success. They're afraid that if they get out there, that it's going to cost them more, that they... You know what? You just need to get to a place to where you are so dominated by God's love, you're so focused on Him, that you don't have these fears restraining and limiting what you will allow God to speak to you. You need to get to a place to where fear isn't a part of your life. And brothers and sisters, we got a lot of Christians that are insecure... They don't know that God loves them. You need to reach a place. David said this. He said, Though the mountains be removed and be cast into the midst of the sea. You know, people today... Here's another little pet peeve with me. People talk about global warming. (laughs) And the seas are rising one inch over the next decade. Think of what would happen if all of the mountains were removed and put into the sea. It would be more than an inch. 
it'd be a tidal wave. Plus, there wouldn't be any mountains to stop them. If ever all the mountains were removed from the land and put into the sea, the seas would rise. All of the land on the face of the earth would be gone. And David said, if all of the mountains are removed and cast into the sea, yet will I not fear. That wasn't just symbolism. That wasn't a hyperbole. He was saying that, man, my faith in God is more real to me than this whole world. And people are just falling apart like a $2 suitcase because of global warming. We just happen to have had one of the coldest winters that anybody has ever gone through. And it's amazing to me that the global warming people see say, that proves global warming. If it's hot, that proves global warming. If it's cold, that proves global warming. It just, you know, whatever happens proves that they're right. There is no nothing. They just have their head in the sand ignoring all of the stuff. I tell you what, if you're fearful, if you think that we're fragile and that things are going to happen differently than what God prophesied in the Bible, if you're afraid of that, you're going to be afraid of people. You're going to be afraid of the criticism. You aren't going to do what God told you to do. Brothers and sisters, we need to get before the Lord and repent. Say, God, forgive me for being afraid of men. Forgive me for limiting you. Saul was a guy who had to have people's approval. Saul, when they went to anoint him to be king, he was hiding in a basket because he was afraid of people. Some people think, well, that was humility. No, that was self-centeredness. It was low self-esteem. That's not humility. That's selfishness. Actually, people who, with low self-esteem who are timid and shy are very prideful people. They are focused on themselves. People who have to have everybody else accept them are super prideful people, super selfish people, focused on themselves. You know what a truly humble person is? Is a person who won't go above what God says about them, nor will they go below. They don't have a bad attitude about themselves. They just are objective. They love God. And if God tells them you're a jerk, they, they'll accept it and change. If God tells them you're a blessing and I love you, they'll say thank you rather than say, oh no, you couldn't love me. A truly humble person is a person that just doesn't have a problem. They'll accept criticism or praise or whatever. Sometimes you hear people, I've had people come up before to ministers and they'll say, oh, thank you for healing me. And of course, it's not the minister that healed you. And I've had some ministers that when they do that, it's just nearly like, oh, no, no, don't give me any glory. No, not for me. And they just go out of their way over the top. Oh, it's not me. It's not me. You know, this friend of mine, Dave Wells, tells a story about being over in Africa and he saw some miracles of healings happen. And the next day he was walking down the road and uh, the people came up and wanted to touch him. And his first thought was, no, no, it's not me, it's Jesus. And the Lord stopped him and said, Dave, says, what would you have thought when I rode that little donkey into Jerusalem and they were throwing their coats on the floor, on the ground and palm branches and they were saying, Hosanna, glory to God. What would you have thought if the donkey would have said, it's not me, it's not me, it's not me. <laughs> says, nobody thought it was the donkey, but the donkey... Nobody thinks it's you. They are trying to reach out to the person who lives on the inside of you. The people, you know, if somebody comes up to me and says, oh, thank you for healing me, I can translate that. I know that they, I know it's not me that healed them. They know it's not me that healed them. And I just say, well, praise God and go on. That's a humble response. But to say, oh, it's not me, it's not me. That just shows your own arrogance and your own insecurity. Amen? Some people think Saul was very humble. No, he was self-centered. He was insecure. He had low self-esteem. He was so dependent upon people's approval. He was afraid that they would make him king and he would fail. And he was afraid that he would disappoint people. That's the reason he hid himself. But then after he became king and he beat uh, Nahash, and all of a sudden everybody came and was singing his praises, he got into it. And he got swelled up with pride. And when David went out and killed Goliath and they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands, it says 
in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18 that from that day forward, Saul envied David and sought to destroy him. All of his problems came because he wanted the acclaim of people. And when somebody else started getting the recognition that he thought was supposed to come towards him, he went to trying to kill him. And he became insecure. And he did things. And he told, Samuel told him, wait, and I'll come and offer a sacrifice. And he says, I couldn't wait because the people were scattered. What would the people think? So he did something that he knew he wasn't supposed to do. And Samuel rebuked him for it and said, because you've done this thing, God has taken the kingdom from you and given it to a neighbor who's better than you. And he turned to walk away, and Saul fell down on the ground and grabbed his uh, robe, and when he did, it tore. And Samuel turned around and he says, God has rent the kingdom of your hand because of this. And so here's Saul, who had been rejected by God, basically taken the kingdom away, lost the favor of God, the anointing of God was off of him. His whole life was in shambles. And Samuel turned around to walk away and Saul said, it doesn't matter, but just turn and honor me in front of the people. God had rejected him. God had turned from him and he didn't care about that. All he cared about was just honor me in front of the people. Don't make me look bad. Come and offer a sacrifice with me. And Samuel, because of that, was in torment his entire life. David, in contrast to that, when his own son rose up against him and tried to take over the kingdom, they started to bring the Ark of the Covenant out of the city of Jerusalem as he was fleeing for his life because the Ark of the Covenant was a symbol of God being with them. And David told him, take the Ark back to its place. And they said, but, you know, that's the blessing of God. And he says, if God is pleased to bring me back, I'll come back to the Ark. And if God is through with me, let him do with me as seems fit. That's secure. That's the reason that David was a man after God's own heart. He didn't do everything right. He committed adultery and murdered to cover up his adultery. But you know what? He loved God. He was secure in God. He didn't do it perfectly. Matter of fact, you know, his... The very failure with David is over in 2 Samuel chapter 11. It says at the time that kings go forth to battle, David stayed in Jerusalem. And he rose up off of his bed at even time. That means he was just getting out of bed when everybody else was going to bed. You know what that means? He was bored. He wasn't doing what he was anointed to do. He wasn't going out to battle. He was so prosperous that he was staying at home and he sent Joab out to fight his battles. And so he was staying home, sleeping all day and prowling at night. (laughs) Prosperity lulled him into a position of false security. But when he finally came to himself, man, he said, if God is pleased, he'll bring me back to the ark. But he says, I, if whatever God wants is fine. That's a person whose commitment is to God. And he prospered. Whereas Saul didn't. Saul was tormented. David prospered. Here we are still talking about the sure mercies of David. And every person in here has read the writings of David and God has spoken to you and inspired you through it because this man, he went against the grain and people criticized him and yet he did what God told him to do. I'm telling you, if you're going to take the limits off of God, if you're going to see success in your life, you're going to have to get to where God's opinion about you is worth a million people's opinion. You're going to have to get to a place to where I don't care what people have to say. I am not going to listen to men. The fear of man brings a snare. And you're going to have to get to where God is absolutely first in your life. And brothers and sisters, I'm saying this in love, but most Christians aren't at that place. Most Christians, you're just... You honestly are more dominated by what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel people in physical bodies than you are God who cannot be seen. And you're going to have to turn that around. You're going to have to get to a place to where God is more real to you. His opinion cares more. You care more about that. It carries more weight with you than anybody or anything else. And if you don't do that, you're going to limit God. You'll have boundaries to what you will do or won't do because the fear of man will stop you and keep you from going forward. But God has a plan for every person here and for you to fulfill that plan, you're going to have to get to that place to where God, I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything, I'll say anything, whatever you tell me to do. 
And if you'll do that, I guarantee you, it'll just loose the power of God in your life. God is looking for somebody who will represent Him that way, who will say the truth and not care what somebody has to say about it. Why are we so afraid of people? Well, I'd lose all my friends. If they'd reject you because you love God and you obey God, they aren't your friend anyway. The scripture says that there's no man that hath left house or father or mother or brother or sister or lands for my sake, but that he shall receive a hundredfold in this life with persecutions and in the world to come everlasting life. You know what? I've lost a lot of friends. I've had a lot of people come against me. I've been threatened to be killed. I've been kidnapped. I've been spit on. I've been maligned. I've had people burn my tapes and books. I've been branded as Jim Jones. I've had a lot of things happen to me. But you know what? I've got thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that love me whose lives have been changed. I've received a hundredfold in this life. And you will too. Don't look at the ones that leave you. They weren't with you in the first place. Look at the ones. You'll meet new brothers and sisters. God will supply your needs. Amen. I'm preaching better than you're listening. This is good preaching. Every one of us have things. We just need to get over the fear of man. Fear limits God. So take the limits off of God. Quit fearing failure. Quit fearing change. Quit fearing men. Quit fearing success. Just get to a place where you love God. And if you'll do that and develop that, I guarantee you, God God is looking for somebody who will take the limits off. He's no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It doesn't matter what your education is. It doesn't matter whether you're a hick from Texas. I can prove that. (laughs) You know what? God delights in using people who don't have anything going for them in the natural because when he uses them, then all of the glory goes to God. People look at that and say, that's not that person. That's got to be God. It doesn't matter what you are or what you aren't. If you would just take the limits off of God and make yourself available, God is looking for someone who'll do that. God would pass over everybody in Arizona tonight to find one person in here who'll say, God, I'll do it. I'll be anything. I'll say anything. I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. I'll give up anything. If you really mean that, God would move in your life in such a supernatural way that I guarantee you, you would be transformed. I believe that with no reservations. You know, we see people come into our Bible college and it's not like we get all of the brightest and the best and I mean they're all just top quality people. We have people come in that are broken and are hurt and problems and their life is just totally screwed up. And yet, they sit under the Word. They start hearing this. They start developing. And we see people come in broken and just destroyed and leave powerful. And it happens over and over and over. We've seen it thousands of people. It happens. It reminds me of, I think it's the bees that you can take just a regular worker bee, but if you feed it that royal jelly, they turn from a worker bee into the queen. It just depends on what you're fed. We see people come in that are mediocre and average in every way and we feed them the Word of God and they leave these powerful people that are going out and changing the world. I don't believe God is a respecter of persons. I don't believe that you have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer to have God use you. But if you just make yourself available and if you would yield yourself to God and allow these things, what the Word of God will just transform you. The Lord is looking for people that He can use and that He can flow through. And your response ought to be, God, look no further. Here I am. God, you don't have to go anywhere else. Stop right here. And if you're willing to do that...